besides religious scripture? Would somebody say that people who are in love and, and coming together on whatever basis they want to and be able to visit each other in, in, in the hospital or adopt children and have a family? There's no other basis besides religious scripture rooted in the past, in the, in the dark ages. And so you see that it's harmful in its content and then it's harmful in the, the way it trains people not to think about reality and to accept the suffering or even try to find meaning in the suffering with the God works in mysterious ways. And the last thing I'll say about that is this is taken to extreme levels. I mean, I was down in, in New Orleans after Katrina and I met people who said this happened to us because we sinned. This happened because we had Mardi Gras. This happened because we had gay people. And this is not just the preachers preaching this. This is actually millions and millions of people believe this, and it's very harmful. And then they try to find meaning in the horrors that happen to them, or they try to repent as if they did something wrong to begin with, which they didn't. I agree, George Bush did something wrong. The system did something wrong. It has committed monstrous crimes, and that's why we need a revolution. But you won't get that if people are enslaved by religion in the ways I'm speaking about. <coughs> You said, Miss Taylor, that um, you couldn't disprove something for which there's no evidence. I think if you think about that, deeper, you'll agree that you can. Uh, many of us would believe that you can disprove that there's a God, which of course there's no evidence. You can show that he's a logical contradiction, that his characteristics are logically contradictory. So that, for example, God is like a married bachelor or like a four-sided triangle. In that case, we can prove for sure there is no such being. So I just wanted to make that point. Now I want to ask you a question. The Nation of Islam is world famous for its grotesque homophobia. Do you think that the radical equality of communism is an antidote to that grotesque homophobia? How would communism go about accomplishing that wonderful ideal? Okay, well, we just put out, I quoted it when I spoke from the Declaration for Women, for the Liberation of Women and the Emancipation of All Humanity. And in this special issue of Revolution, we go into what is the origin of sexual repression, of the oppression of women, and of even what we would call the heteronormativity. Why is it that it's so vehemently, homosexuality is so vehemently opposed? Why is that something that's, that's opposed by religion and opposed by ruling structures? for a long period of time, thousands of years in human history. And we go through that in the very earliest human, sp human communities, we existed somewhat egalitarian communal societies. There, were a, there was a naturally occurring division of labor between men and women because there was no formula. Women were involved in childbirth and child rearing. And so there was a naturally occurring division of labor, but it was not an oppressive or institutionalized relation of oppression of men dominating women. It was only with the emergence of classes, I'm, I'm compressing, but it was the only with the emergence of a certain amount of surplus of private property, in particular the private ownership of the means to produce wealth, that you started to have the institutionalized subject, subjugation of women. Because for the first time in human history, you had the need to control whose children belonged to which men in order to pass down property. It's an interesting thing um, when, when uh, Europeans first colonized the Americas, there's an interesting exchange between the Iroquois and some of the French settlers, <coughs> where the French settlers came and told these native people, you know, you have to control your women, because they, they, they weren't in monogamous, women were free to have sex with other people if they wanted to, as, as men often are, but it was equal there. And they said, you have to control your women, because if you don't control who they sleep with, you won't know who your children are who they belong to. And, and the Iroquois looked back at the French and said, you people, you French are very weird. You care only about your own children. We care about all of them. And I think this was a society before there was the emergence, the institutionalized emergence of patriarchy and class relations and the need to, in, to, to control women's sexuality as a way of controlling who passed down wealth and inheritance lines to, to back up. The whole notion of a child being illegitimate had no meaning. The illegitimacy is illegitimate heir of, of inheritance. And so it's with this that women's sexuality becomes constrained, and it's also with this that the notion that any sexuality outside of the confines of the male-female family and marriage, including homosexuality, becomes demonized and criminalized as well. 
And this is what gave rise to the codes, this idea of enforcing and enshrining the patriarchal monogamous family. And I have to say one other thing about this, the origin of the word family reveals this as well. The word family comes from the Latin, it's familia. It, refer, refer, it refers to the male head of household and all of his living possessions. In that is slaves, women, and children over whom he owns them and has the power of life and death. The family, and this is something I think we would strongly disagree on, the family is not a romantic, idyllic institution that came forward or was ordained by God or anybody else to, to be the unit for rearing children. It was actually a unit, it was an economic unit, a, a unit of oppression and exploitation. And that is still the large, and it, it still shapes it today. It's why the home is the most dangerous place a woman or a child can be. And that's still the case today in this country. And, it, and it's, it's not everything, I don't want to go on any longer, but it's bound up with. The enforcing of sexual relations in that form is bound up with the demonization and criminalization of, hom of homosexuality. And the object of communist revolution is to actually get beyond classes and class relations and the need for private property to be inherited. And in that way, we'll also get rid of the notions of illegitimacy around children, the notions that women should be reduced to being breeders or sexual objects of men, and that we will emancipate all sexual relations from domination and oppression relations. And so that people can all be free to participate in sexuality willingly, voluntarily, safely, when they're ready to, and when it's mutual and respectful, and not on any other basis. When do I begin? <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> Let me disabuse you of the thought Relationships not based upon sex. That's 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 sickness. That that is sick because that is not the basis of relationships. Mm -hmm. You love who you want to love, but out of necessity, the condition of the society that I come from is one of being oppressed. Those concepts you're talking about, they come out of Europe. That is the ice man's inheritance. Look, at, look, living in the caves and hillsides of Europe, you don't talk much about that history. And neither does Angles, anybody else. They don't talk about that history. And everything you talk about, Latin, Greek, that, that's what they were. The, the Romans were free lovers. They loved women. Europe, the man would come there, knock somebody on the head, kidnap the woman. That's where that patriarchal stuff comes. Kidnap the woman, and her parents would pick up rocks and throw rocks at them. That is what that that is what the rights represents. Picking her up and taking her over the threshold is not some romantic notion. That's what he did when he kidnapped her and took her into his cave. This is the ice man inheritance. When you live in a place that has long winters. Doesn't have a lot of greenery, has a scarcity of raw materials and all the things that you need that we had. And when you came south of the Mediterranean, your, your people worshiped our fathers like they were gods. And I'm going to say it again. Our people did not worship a spook mystery god. Our gods were always portrayed as men. So when I say that you disbelieve in something you don't understand, what I'm trying to say to you is, is that man has, is infinite in his potential and possibilities. To deny God, or I'll take the word out, deny human potential is to deny the ability to bring into existence the very thing that you claim you want to bring in through revolution. Because the truth of the matter is, is that the enemy of us all controls the means of production and the weapons that we have to fight with. So it's going to take people literally walking through 50 caliber machine guns. I don't know what they're going to be on, whether they'll be carrying this book or maybe they'll believe in a, 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 a god up in the sky or whatever, but it's going to take people that are willing to be in the face of a machine gun. And that doesn't come from some science or logic. There's some emotion in that that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 
the willingness to go in and to jump on a hand grenade so that you can save your comrades when you're in battle. See, this is no just no talk, some intellectual exercise. If you really want to bring into existence what you're talking about, somebody got to die and somebody has to kill. So we don't like this God that kills, but we want the, the press is just going to go away because we talk at him. You want to have to fight. So you got a God in here that seems to be, he's quite violent and he is a little schizophrenic. That's right. Because when you get into a fight, the hell, if I get into a fight, don't you tell me calm down. If he threw a lick on me and I'm fighting, if you see me in the air and the bear's pulling out all my hair, don't pick it up, leave it there, but you help the bear. Because I'm going to be on, I'm going to be fighting. And you need to be fighting and stop. You know, this is good for intellectual talk and touring campuses. But when it really gets down to it, it's going to take a long time for humanity to heal from the war that has to take place in order to bring about what you say needs to come about and bring about what I believe needs to come about. Now, we're not no grotesque, um, you say, a homo homophobic. I'm not afraid of homosexuals. That don't bother me any. Any, If that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. We don't stone homosexuals. We don't cut off their head. That's not our way. But we have women and men that need to have a decent, honorable relationship, not based upon sex. A nation can rise no higher than its woman. That's right. Where there are no decent women, there are no decent men, because the woman is the mother of civilization. Let's talk science. In the beginning, when the child is born and brought into the world, before that child has cognitive ability, there is something that goes on in between that child coming out of the womb and cognitive ability, and that is that they are programmed with things that they literally do not remember. It's before memory. So now, if you've got a crazy mother while the father in this patriarchal society is out doing his thing and he's oppressing this woman, then this woman is going to put the hatred of that man in that child. That child is not going to know why they act the way they act. So now you've got Sigmund Freud snorting coke and telling you what's wrong with you. You hate your mother and all that kind of stuff. And he's right. Because <laughs> of the stuff that we do to our children and not knowing. The woman is the key to the revolution. You cannot give birth to a revolutionary unless you go ahead and teach the woman to be the revolutionary because the man is too busy doing whatever he's doing. The woman is the true revolutionary. Heaven lies at her feet. And if you want a real revolution, then train up the women, not the men. Because when you train a man, you train an individual. When you train a woman, you train the nation. You want the revolution to live? And make sure you preserve the women who get birthed and teach the children. They will preserve your revolution all the way through time immemorial. That's my response. It's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Kevin. Uh, going back to the question asked first. Uh, going back to the question asked first, this gentleman asked this question. Uh, I'm sorry. But, uh, Sansara? Yeah. Of, uh, of, of a Bible that speaks of, of, of hate, I guess, and killing and murder. Okay, this is what uh, my Bible says. From uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, 6 verses. I'd be a little long, but if you guys can bear with me. Uh, if I speak the language of men and angels, but do not have love, I am surrounding, I am a, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Excuse me. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it is not boastful, it is not conceited, it does not act improperly, it is not selfish, it is not provoked, it does not keep a record of wrong. Finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So, I don't know what Bible she's reading from this people <laughs> of, of, of hate and killing and murder. See what I'm saying? But that's what First uh, Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 6 says. And um, to the gentleman here, um, I don't know, are you suggesting that, that, that I rely on a, a woman who, who, I, who I don't know, this one next to me, per se, um, to 
to guide me and, and where I need to be in, in this life. And if there and if there is no afterlife, you know, then, then what happens at death? This is my question. Okay, well, let me first say that I would rather that every Christian on the planet root themselves in that one, those six lines that you just read, than the Bible as a whole. That would be a whole different conversation we'd be having. But let me ask you, while I'm saying something else, to look up Numbers 21, and um, then you can tell me why you think that that should be in your book, too. And you can share it with us in a second, because I think everybody would be intrigued by it. Or Psalms 137, verse 9, or we could go through them. But why don't you look up number 21? And let me say this about motherhood and women. Because this is one thing I just have to say. People do this, and I know the nation, you guys do this. You say, we love our women. You want to get to the nation. You go through the women. There's all this exaltation of women because women give birth. This is harmful. This is not very good at all. This is very bad, I have to say. Women are human beings. We're not breeders. The fact that we can biologically have children is not our essential role. It's not our essential role. Women have the capacity to participate equally and fully in every sphere of human endeavor. And you cannot hold up and exalt the, the idea of motherhood and the notion of motherhood as the crowning achievement and the defining characteristic of women without bringing along all the baggage that goes with that. Because once you have women defined as mothers, first and foremost, this is what I was going through the history before, when women happen to give birth, we happen to be the ones who give birth, but it's not defining of us. No, it's yes, we happen to have uteruses, I'm sorry. Our intellects are a lot more defining than that. We are, this is part of what's unique about our species. But when I went through this, if it's just something that women do as a part of the overall society, that's one thing. Once you get to the place where you have private property, you have class relations, you have patriarchy, women become breeders. They are viewed as property of men. This is enshrined in the, in the Bible. This is enshrined in the Quran. This is enshrined in all the religious texts and scriptures. And this notion, it negates our full humanity and capacity. You do not get women as mothers without everything that goes along with that. Women as beaten, women as stoned to death, women as killed all over the world and including in this country. This goes back to the home is not the most dangerous place for men. The home is the most dangerous place for women. This is bound up with the notion that the man is the head of the woman and the woman's duty is to bear children. Those things are in Extricable. Don't know about Al Green. Those things are inextricable. <laughs> you can't say it. Oh, you don't know about Al Green. Excuse me. On a point of elder privilege, I have had my hand up a long time, and the gentleman with the gray hair saw me and walked away with the microphone. I believe that a picture is worth a million words. This goes back to the ancient goddess Hathor, black. Okay, and coming all the way up to the stolen images uh, by the Roman Catholic Church turning Christ white. And I have a picture of that too. Jesus Christ white. Okay, now, if we look at what, excuse me, I think I can be heard. Um, if you look at history before the Bible, you would be looking at the book of the dead. All right? If you look at the ethics, you would be looking beyond the code of Hammurabi. You would be looking at the... I think we should let... The yeah, wait, I, I don't want you to interrupt me. No, sir. I should do, and I'm here too. And um, what I'm saying to you is before the Ten Commandments, you had those ethics from black people that said, I will not kill. I will not commit fornication. And so therefore, if a person is homosexual, they have a role to play. They are to bring good into the world. They're not to fornicate all over uh, the world. They are to bring good into the world. And the other thing, the Bible has been retranslated 900 times. Everybody in the Bible was not white. It's not a European book, if that's the only book we're going by. What I'm saying to you is, look at the book of the dead. Uh, Dr. Please ask your question so the speakers can respond. Tia, Moore, Tia Moyo has written a book about black women. European women have always opposed black women's liberation because they wanted somebody in their damn kitchen and in their bed with their man that they didn't want to have sex with. Okay, so. 
to the to the young man to the young man in the back I asked you to look up in the Bible I, I asked you to go to the wrong verse so I want to correct myself if you could go to numbers 31 chapters uh, numbers 31 17 and 18 and I would say that it's you know that it's true the Bible has been translated many times it has changed forms but this is a, exactly a reflection including it's been it's been rewritten and reinterpreted by white supremacist society in this country and in Europe that's that's that I mean there are elements of what the woman was raising that that I just want to highlight that are important those are, that's one of them and this is exactly a reflection of this is written by human beings not by gods and it's and it backs up relations of uh, exploitation and oppression on this question of, of white women fighting not for black women I think look there's been a lot of there's been this is another thing we discussed this is why I'm a revolutionary and a communist there has been a bourgeois feminist movement that has fought for the rights of some women to gain equal equal status to get in on running an empire to get in on these things, you see somebody like Hillary Clinton, that's not emancipation for women or for anybody. When I talk about emancipating women, I am talking about women joining together with men, together with people of all different nationalities, people who are oppressed and exploited to make a revolution and to change this world in its entirety, not competing sections of interests of oppressed. So I just want to make that clarification. I, I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs> and, and honestly, you know, when you deal with the two things I, I never talked about at work when I used to work on a job, religion and politics. And what I want you all to understand is, is that we have these positions that we have. She is not going to change me. I'm not going to change her. And if you came in with your mind made up already, you're not, we, we, we didn't change your mind. But there's one thing that has not changed. When we walk out of this door, <laughs> the enemy's still going to be in charge. Yeah. And most of us, 99.9%, except for the ones who were sent here by the government, are still going to be oppressed. So I'm saying to each and every one of us, you know, we got touched up a little bit, but don't take it personal. This is only business. We got a world to build. I'm going to do what I do. She's going to do what she does. You do what you have to do, and let's see who's right. Because ultimately, I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing because she says stop, and she's not going to stop doing what she says do because, uh, because uh, uh, I said stop. She's not going to stop. So we need to go on and do what we got to do. Professor Clevin is going to keep on teaching. I'm going to keep on learning. We're going to keep on doing what we got to do. And that's where I am with this thing. In the end, in the end, you can walk out of here mad at me, mad at her, mad at us, but still the conditions will be the same unless we pull together and do what's right. Now what's right is going to be a constant debate as we walk down this road, but we're going to keep on walking. I know there are so many questions, we could probably stay here all night, but I think we should break up into formal discussion. Uh, I think what I think we will find is that most of us, in terms of uh, justice, and liberation are on the same page. And even when we disagree about some of the views that we were talking about here today, we're going to be on the same side when we're on the front lines. So uh, let's uh, give a hand to the speakers and uh, we'll have a formal discussion. I just want to, before people leave, I just want to also thank everybody for coming out and remind you that we have these questionnaires. And because, look, we, would, we could have had this conversation for a lot longer, and I appreciate you guys sticking through it. Write down what you thought, further questions, ideas, and give an email address or a phone number, because we do want to stay in touch and find ways to continue this dialogue. Thank you.